what humans were doing on these two vastly different continents. And uh, the, the superb preservation of information in the Middle East, the artifacts, the animal bones, and most famously the human fossils, uh, actually give us the opportunity to paint a much more detailed picture of what people were doing back then, what they looked like and what they were doing than we can at many, many other archaeological sites. The uh, UNEC is located in a straight line 65 kilometers from here. Uh, we're just near the Armenian border and we're at a nematode between western Georgia, which is very humid and subtropical, and eastern Georgia, which is semi-arid, a steppe environment. So from that perspective, Dumanisi occupied a very strategic place on a geographic and environmental scale. And as we'll see in a minute, it also occupied a very strategic place on a local scale. This is the Dumanisi promontory. This promontory was created by the Pinaswari River, which comes from Armenia, and the Mashavera River, which comes from the west, from the Javapeti Mountains. And the promontory today is mostly covered by forests, uh, but under those trees are the ruins of a Bronze Age and medieval. Oh. Georgians are so clever. <laughs> uh, so these 100 meter cliffs are the result of the river cutting down through this basalt, what we call the Mashavera basalt. And uh, so it created this naturally fortified situation. So uh, in medieval times, in particular, the Medici was a very important center. It collected tariffs of material coming from the south into the Silk Road. They minted their own coins there. There's a uh, 11th, beautiful 11th century church on the site that's still being used. But interestingly, there are also mosques and Muslim schools on the site. So this was obviously at the border of Christianity and Islam. And so Dumanisi's history is also very fascinating. But remarkably, underneath that city, in the 1980s, people began finding fossils of extinct animals. That led paleontologists from this museum to go excavate fossils, and in the process they turned up artifacts, and so it was pretty clear that Dumanisi was indeed an archaeological site. Then in 1991, uh, a German and Georgian uh, team found the first jawbone. I think you can see a cast in these cases here. Uh, which was, of course, spectacular news. And the, uh, the Georgian scientists attributed it to Homer Agaster, a relative of Homo erectus from Africa. Now we call all the fossils from Dumanisi Homo erectus, but, as we'll see, they are just barely Homo erectus. They're very small body, small brain, and they exhibit a wide range of variation in their facial features, and to some degree, in their stature. So this promontory here at the confluence of the two rivers uh, created this local strategic position, a commanding view of the river valleys, easy access to water, animals migrate down the river valleys on their seasonal movements. So if you're a carnivore, Dumanisi turns out to be a fantastic place to live, and we'll see that's exactly what happened back then. So the excavations have been concentrated here in the center of the promontory. I'll show you more details. Ooh. Good. Uh, I'll take you through a little bit of the history of our uh, research at the site. The, uh, the first job was found in 1991. Uh, I did my first work at the in 1995 and 96 with Carl Swisher from Berkeley, and our job was to define the geology and to establish the age of the site, which we did. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, how old is the Macy? First question. Age is all important in archaeology, of course, because we want to construct the sequence of events, and we want to be able to correlate the Macy with other sites in Eurasia and in Africa. So, we start actually upstream from the Macy at this locality called Femal Orismani, and there are two basalts. Basalt is a rock that forms from molten lava, black lava, and there are two basalts here, the Marshavera basalt and the Orismani. And the absolute ages done by radiometric dating on those are 1.85 million and 1.76 million. And all of these sediments in between are the sediments that we have at the Dimonisi site. So, next slide. Then within the DC, we have a date on the basalt that our sediments sit on at 1.85. And then we have this interesting uh, uh, means of dating called, called paleomagnetism, because the Earth's poles flip back and forth over time, and the chronology of those reverses is very well known. And among other incredible facts about Dimonisi is that right in the middle of our sequence we have a paleomagnetic reversal. So all of these oldest sediments have normal polarity, north is north, and right at this point here, at that contact, the poles reverse. And we know globally that this reversal took place 1.78 million years ago. So this is a test bit that's actually my son David digging with me in 2005. Uh, we dug this uh, test pit at M5, and for the first time found artifacts in these oldest deposits of the Venisi. So this meant that we had a very long sequence that we could study, and Toyota and I are now in our fourth year of excavating in this location. I'll show you in the next. The, so one of the interesting perspectives that we have to keep about the Malisi is that it is on the strategic peninsula, this promontory. It was a, a place that people could come back to over and over again. And we now know that they did that hundreds, if not thousands of times. Unlike the East African Rift Valley settings, where much of our information from this time period comes, those are very dynamic environments. There's a lot of faulting, there's a lot of changing of lake levels, there are ash falls, so the landscape there uh, changes all the time, meaning that there's no single place that's always good to come back to. So they have good records, but they're scattered across the landscape. Dimonisi is really like a big cave that people would use for thousands of years as a place. So our record is long and extensive and complex. Next, please. So, you may have seen some of the cats already, but let's have a look at our people. The, uh, we know in detail what the Dimonisi people look like because we have now something in the neighborhood of 75 human fossils, including five complete crania. Four of them have their jaws making a skull and lots of postcranial bones. So we know their whole anatomy from head to toe, literally. The bones, uh, not only of humans, but animals are beautifully preserved. So here's a human femur. The way we found it in the ground, notice that it's complete. It's not broken or cracked. We just lift them out of the ground, put them in a box, and bring them to the lab. That's true for the skulls as well. It's really quite amazing. Uh, here's a, a, a uh, MRI image. We take our skulls to the hospital and scan them before excavating. And you can see the empty cranial vault partly filled with sediment. So this proves that these people were buried very quickly after they died. And uh, they're buried by ashes, but unlike Pompeii, these were cold ashes. So the conditions for burial were perfect. Quick burial under the very gentle depositional conditions. Uh, <clears throat> just to look at a few of our individuals, this is the, the famous old man who lost all of his teeth years before he died. This was a big surprise to the scientific community, uh, raising questions of how do you live back then with no fire to 
cook and tenderize your meat and no teeth. So my idea generally is that they had cutting implements and they had pounding implements so they could uh, soften their food. They also were clearly anxious to get the soft tissues out of animals, not only the, the internal organs, but the marrow from the, from the bones and the brain, all of which you can eat quite easily, even if you don't have teeth. This is um, one of our young women from Dimonisi. You'll see her reconstructed in just a second. But notice the complete preservation of that skull. It's just beautiful. Her teeth were uh, pretty threatening, uh, but her brain was quite small, about much less than half of the size of, of our brains next. So altogether, we have uh, a number of skulls and mandibles and quite a bit of variability. Notice this big jaw here. Uh, we found that jaw in 2000, and then in 2005, we found the 